Today we're going to be talking about long-term buy and hold utilizing Section 8 as opposed to trying to do rehabs. This is your show. This is the show where I work for you directly, taking your needs. I'm going through the MLS, and I'm trying to find the best possible deal for you guys. Put down 25%. That's the perfect way to buy this. That's why real estate investing is the greatest industry in the world. Welcome to the show, folks, the show where I help investors like you get in the game, y'all. Now, today I'm working with my girl, Paula. Paula, you're from Austin, Texas. And today, Paula, I want to talk to you about long-term Section 8 rentals versus rehabs, right? The reason I want to talk to you about this, Paula, is we've been going back and forth, doing a lot of videos together, and you've been very interested in trying to put together bird deals, right? Buy, renovate, rent, refinance, repeat, okay? But the issue that you are running into is you're not capitalized enough to properly take down bird deals, right? You're trying to uh, require an intense amount of hard money loans, right? And folks, I know a lot of you hear about hard money loans, and you hear that hard money loans are like cash, right? You got cash, you got hard money, interchangeable, okay? Here's the problem. There's only two motherfuckers in this world that think that cash and hard money are the same thing. The motherfuckers selling hard money and the motherfuckers buying it, okay? <laughs> Sellers don't view hard money as uh, the same, right? So because of that, because of that, Paul, I've been talking to you about doing multiple investment strategies, right? Talk to you about other things I think you can do with the available cash on hand and your ability to get finance, right? One of the options, I did uh, several videos for you on wholesaling, right? I thought wholesaling would make some sense for you, right? Not shooting for the stars, some practical wholesaling deals, deals where you can get in for 20 grand or less cash because you have that on hand with the goal of quickly turning that 20 grand into a $5,000 profit, right? Told you many different ways we can do that. And the cool thing is with that wholesaling strategy and all that jazz, the onus wasn't even on you to actually be the seller, right? Because a lot of people think, oh, you can just do wholesale deals like you could buy a rental. No, like if you're going to be a full-on wholesaler, folks, you got to run the whole business. you got to know how to do marketing, sales, ARV, estimates, this or that. How I do it, right, I do almost all the heavy lifting, right? You just buy, I analyze, I run the numbers, and then I sell it on my show, the Investment Properties for Sales show, sell it as a bird deal to other investors who are more opt- uh, to take those deals down, Paul, because they're more capitalized than you are, right? It makes more sense for them. For you, it doesn't make sense because you don't have enough cash to get in, make the offer, be able to afford to buy the property, pay for the rehab, and do all that stuff cash. If, if you can't do it all cash, you have to make these offers contingent on these hard money loans, and sellers don't want to see that, right? So I thought wholesaling would make some sense for you. And for everyone else out there who's in a similar position to Paula, uh, if you think wholesaling might make some sense for you, check out my course. I link to it below. The reason my course is so important, folks, is this is wholesaling in the real world. Wholesaling deals you could actually do. All the other people, all that guru bullshit, you ain't going to see none of that, right? What they're calling wholesaling today is not wholesaling. That is brokering real estate illegally. Number one, it being illegal is a problem for you, right? You can get fines. I've seen fines by the Ohio Division of Real Estate and other states is close, is almost in, in like the six and seven figure range, right? There's that, number one. That's a problem. That, notwithstanding, the other problem is what they're teaching you. It's not really practical. They make it seem like you can do this, but in reality, you have to run like 10 different businesses. And, and the way that what they're teaching you guys, it's just not going to happen for you in the real world, right? That's why you see all those people that go to those crazy high seminars, pay 40 grand. They all get mad and nobody ever does their deals, right? That's not what I do, right? What I do is actually teach you the actual principles to get deals done the right way, right? So if you guys are interested in learning the overall strategy of wholesaling, you can check out my course, right? And then again, Paula, I went through a lot of that with you on those specific deals. So I think that's one avenue for you, right? But that, we're getting off track a little bit here, and I'm sorry for that, but what this video is, is me also giving you another avenue that I think you should take, which is going to be much better for you than the Burr Avenue, because I just don't think you're capitalized to properly do it, right? And that is talking about long-term, low 
income section eight investing. I think that is going to make sense. And the property that I have for you right now, I think this, this could work for you, right? So if you want to go the wholesaling route, I gave you those videos. We could try that, right? But this is also another route. I think this or the wholesaling route will be smarter for you than focusing on these bird deals. So what I want to do now, I'm going to take a quick break, and then I'm going to get into everything on this property, why I think you should focus on low-income Section 8 investing, and of course, we're going to go over the numbers to show you how to actually put the deal together. Hey, Steve. What are you doing? Oh, nothing. Just saving money on my rental property insurance. Oh, my, Steve. Take me now. Holton Wise. Real estate investing made easy. Wow, I'm so glad I clicked that link below. Welcome back. We are going to get into the details on this Section 8 rental, dude. I dig this one. Uh, quite a bit because it's got like a value add component too, but it's not going to necessarily have to be like a rehab, okay? 816 West 22nd Lorraine, 44052. Priced at 66 grand, which is very attractive. Six days on the market. This is like a value add opportunity, and this is beautiful Section 8 money right here, folks. But there's not Section 8 money coming in today, and that's why we're going to get some some value add opportunity here, right? This is a big old house and it's in pretty good shape, right? We got a tenant already in there. They're living there. They're doing their thing, okay? It's a little dated, but it's already making some coin. But here's what we got going on, okay? We have this tenant in there. I wrote this down. They're paying six and a quarter, right? Regular month to month cash tenant paying six and a quarter. This is not a six and a quarter rental. No, 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 no. No, this is a beautiful Section 8 cash flow monster, cash flow machine, cash flow. I don't know. It's going to make a lot of cash, though, when you put the Section 8 tenants in there. Why? Because Section 8 tenants will be paying 1050 1050 okay? 12600 a year. And then you run your fixed variable expense uh, estimates, things of that nature. You're looking to clear over 500 bucks a month, folks, right? Now. Here's where the value add comes into play, okay? If you give me this property with a 1050 Section 8 tenant in it, I'm selling it for 80 grand on the investment properties for sale show in this neighborhood, right? 80 grand all day, okay? Maybe even 85. They are asking only 66 because we currently have a tenant and they're paying six and a quarter. So that makes it not that attractive to investors. Some investors who don't know, who are not in the know, might not know what's happening, might think that this is actually what the market rent is, right? No, no, no. 1050, right? We got to get Section 8 in there eventually. Now, here's why I consider Section 8 the cheat code to low-income investing. When you're investing in lower-income neighborhoods, the biggest issue you run into, the biggest hurdle you run into is finding tenants to pay rent all the time, okay? Sometimes they run into situations in their lives and, you know, they're not prepared for it, right? Their car breaks down, they don't go to work, they lose their job. Uh, they freaking blew the money on, uh, I don't know, freaking new shoes or something. Like, they just... They, 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 when something bad in their lives happens, they don't have savings, and frequently they think, you know, not paying rent is an option. I, mean, I shouldn't say frequently. It doesn't happen all the time, but I'm just saying, like, more frequently than in non-low-income neighborhoods. That's just the nature of investing in real estate, right? And the more risky a neighborhood is, right, the more risky you run into non-pay, okay? So my opinion on the whole matter is... Section 8 alleviates so much of that problem, right? Because you eliminate that, right? Oh, you something happened, unexpected circumstance, you can't pay rent. Not when the government's paying it, folks. When the government's paying it, it comes in all the time. So that's our end game, right? But what we have here, we already have a long-term tenant who pays. They don't pay enough, but they already pay. They've proven to be a consistent payer, and that's the issue, right? Sometimes you're going to find tenants, you think they'll be consistent payers, and then they're not. This one already is. So we don't want to just, like, r immediately remove this tenant. That would be crazy. That would be stupid because you got to rehab the inside of the unit. It was dated to get 1050. you got to cosmetically upgrade it, right? Somebody's not going to move in to that dated-looking thing as it is. probably got to spend five, ten grand to upgrade it. We don't want to do that. No, 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 no. We want to keep that person in there as long as they keep paying, right? So I would probably renew their lease, right? Maybe 
bump them up to like 750 because that's still way cheaper than it should be. And then after that, go up like 25 bucks a year. Hopefully, we get them up to around 1000 or so before they move out. Then when they move out, then we bring in that Section 8, right? Here's the thing. You can't look at every single rental property's tenant as if the tenant will always be there. The tenants are important, but not on an individual basis, right? Tenants are important to your investments. Without tenants, you don't get rent, okay? But an individual tenant is fairly irrelevant to you as an investor. This individual tenant already pays. That's great. Let's ride that out as long as we can. That's a bonus. But the fact that this individual tenant is going to be paying lower than what your market tenants, your tenant base should and would be paying is what doesn't really matter, right? Collecting a little bit of less rent for a short period of time is irrelevant. Likewise, if you were to buy a property and one specific tenant happened to be paying more than what the market rent is, that doesn't make that house more valuable. That's just a small moment in time that's relatively irrelevant when you look at your investment over the long haul. So you got to focus on the market rents. So with all that said, should be an above 80K property, 80, 85, 77, somewhere in there, right? Okay. If you already have the Section 8 tenants in there, more buyers don't focus on the fact that we got to focus on the long term. They do see that rent and they do their immediate price to rent ratio thing. So that's going to help us. But it's still, in reality, that's really what it's worth, right? So that's our value add here, right? So they're asking 66. I said we push it a little bit further, even harder, because a lot of investors don't look at the long term. I said we try to pick it up at 62. If we pick it up at 62, we're looking at a $15,000 down payment. Bank kinks in 46. And assuming you were able to get that current tenant all the way up to market rent over a course of a few years, you're looking at a long-term cash-on-cash projection of 17%. That is why Section 8 properties are amazing, right? You can kick off a 17% return with relative consistency because the big thing is like 17%, that's great, but what if I really don't get my rent? When you go Section 8 for the long haul, you're almost guaranteeing you're going to get that rent. Thanks for watching. Subscribe to Holton Wise TV for more financial information, education, and entertainment.